Hello internet friends, Chris Masto here, and I'm finally doing a more detailed technical video again. This one is going to be about this thing here, the Sonoff NS Panel Smart Scene Wall Switch. We'll start by taking it out of the box, seeing what's in there, playing around with it a bit, and then I'll show you how to put custom firmware on it and hook it up to Home Assistant for ultimate home automation flexibility. I'll put some chapter markers down below so you can skip ahead if that's what you're here for. But first, let's start with some brief background on what this thing actually is for. When you're installing home automation, you need switches and buttons so you can control your lights and other devices. There are tons of options out there. Of course, you can have basic switch with maybe dimming capabilities. You can get some old school looking toggle switches that also happen to be smart and connected to the network. You can get things that have lots and lots of different buttons in one. You can even get special purpose controls to be able to adjust the color of your lighting. Or you can get battery powered control panels that stick on the wall, or you can take off to the couch to control your devices from there. But these products all have one downside in common. They're stuck with the controls that are built into them physically. Sometimes that's good. When you reach for a light switch, it's nice to have no surprises. But for some applications, you want a really flexible interface, and that means some kind of touch screen. I have a few examples here. This one is called HA Switch Plate. It's an open source project where you order the circuit board, you get the parts, put it together yourself, build a 3D printed enclosure or a wall switch plate if you want, and then you have this really simple display that you can configure to have pages of different controls and information on it. This one's not really set up, but you get the idea. Could show the weather here or have buttons to turn on the lights, lock the doors, arm the lasers, whatever you need to do. This one here is kind of the next evolution. So this one is running another open source program called OpenHasp. This one's a lot more flexible. It has a nicer screen. Um, you can use different models of screens with this. I bought this from Amazon. This is called a Lanbon L8. You put the OpenHasp code onto this, and again, you design the interface. You can be as creative as you want with the controls on this. And so that brings us back to the topic of this video. Sonoff, who makes a bunch of different home automation products, released this thing, the NS Panel, on Kickstarter a while back. It's a lot like the Lanbon screen here, but it's bigger, it's maybe a little bit nicer designed, and it has some physical buttons on it as well. It's always a pain when you only have touchscreen controls. You don't want to have to wake the screen up and swipe around in order to turn the lights on. I'm not much of an unboxer, but I guess I should describe it. it comes in a cheap blue box. Um, hard to open without tearing it. There we go. Um, this is the US model. They have a European model as well. Um, different shape for kind of their standard layouts. It's more of a square. This is more of a rectangle. All uh, right, in there we have the device itself, some screws, little instruction manual, guide, And that's it. So in comparison to the Lanbon L8 that I was showing earlier, I'm not sure how well this shows up on the camera there, we'll try to get reflection. You can see that the bezel on this one is pretty big. The screen is relatively small. This does have a nice larger screen. And like I said, it has these two physical buttons on here. So if you want something to actually click, you can use those. And then for the touch screen part, you can use that. It also has two relays in it. If we look at the connections on the back, there's neutral and line in, and then there's L1, L2 out that you can use for turning devices on and off. However, those are only two amp relays. Since the typical lighting circuit in the US is 15 amps, it would be pretty easy for your lights to overload the capacity of one of these relays. You should be careful with that. I personally have no interest in using those relays, so I'm just going to ignore them and use this purely as a touchscreen control panel. I've cleaned up a bit so we can bring in the Cliff Quick Test and wire this up and see what it looks like when you switch it on. 
So we'll go on the back here. There is a protective door to keep your fingers from touching the exposed terminals. This does have pretty crappy screw terminals and not those nice clampy things. It's just screws that press down onto the wire. Good enough for this neighborhood, as they say. So let's go ahead and screw in the neutral and the line. I'll put the cover on, even though it's not doing much for me. This is obviously still a little dangerous when it's outside of an electrical box. I promise to keep my hands away from the kill zone at all times. Let's do some peeling. All right, a little different setup here, so hopefully you can see the screen. I'm going to power it up, and we can see it boot here. Get a little sawn-off animation, and then it goes into pairing mode. This is, right away, one of the disadvantages of this device. It only works with the sawn-off eWeLink app until later on when we hack the firmware. So I'm going to just show that really quickly, how that works. I save you the trouble of all the signing up for an account and logging in, cloud things you have to do. But we're in the app here, so I'm going to go to add a device. And this one pairs via Bluetooth. So we'll say that the indicator is blinking correctly, even though there's no indicator. Uh, and it's found the device here. So we'll connect to that. We'll then give it my Wi-Fi credentials. And there we go, device added successfully. We'll leave the name NS panel, click done. And so now we have some stuff on the screen here. It shows the time and temperature. Um, and then we can also use the phone. So if I tap on this on the phone, um, it has controls here for turning on and off the two relays that are connected to it. I have a light bulb attached to channel one. So you'll see there when I turn that on, that lights up. So I'm pressing the button on the screen to do that. You can also press the physical button here. So that's, that's the channel one control. And that's the channel two control. I don't have anything plugged into that, but you can see in the app that it flashes when that button's activated. And that's basically what it does out of the box. The only other thing you can do here, well, a couple of things, I guess, if we're gonna be fair, if you swipe left, there is a setting here for a thermostat mode. This is something that seems to be popular in China, or at least in a bunch of Chinese devices, where you could have this act as a thermostat, so you'd hook up your heater through this thing and it would turn on and off based on the, the temperature in the room. I think that's kind of a bad idea, so I'm not particularly interested in that. Um, and if you swipe, uh, this is hard to use, if you swipe the other way, there is a widget feature where it says, please create widgets in the eWeLink app. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and then the only other thing is you can access some settings here. So you can control how long before it goes into sleep mode and whether it's portrait or landscape orientation it defaults to this weird landscape setup here. So let's demonstrate the widgets. The only way I can do this, because I don't have any other Sonoff devices, and again, this only controls Sonoff devices through the eWeLink app. Um, so I'm going to create a scene here instead and we'll just, we'll do a tap to perform um, and we'll tell it to um, turn on channel one. How about that? And I'll say, click save here a billion times and we'll just call this test save. And so now I have my test scene, which I can activate from the phone. So if I activate that scene, it turns the light on to turn it back off manually. Um, and now what we can finally do after that is go into the NS panel and go down to uh, widgets and add, and then I can add this one, save. <clears throat> Disappointingly, there are only eight slots here. You can see the thing goes from one to eight. So 
the way this works now is if I slide over, I'd have up to eight potential icons here. And when you select one of them, it does, well, that didn't do it because I didn't press the button properly. Yeah, so that's, that's what it does. You press the button and it activates the scene. Um, pretty basic. I guess there are two things that are a problem with this for me is I don't have any other Sonoff devices. I have all kinds of stuff in my house that this cannot control. And I really despise this layout. This is a fixed layout. So you, you're forced to have this weather screen here with, you can't even change the picture. And you're forced to have this thermostat thing, even if you're not using it. And if you want to have any custom controls, they can only go on this screen and you can only have eight of them. And also these buttons are forced to control these relays. You can't decide that you want the buttons to do something else. So that's what it does out of the box. Pretty limited device as far as I'm concerned. The good news though, is you don't have to use their stock firmware. You can load your own onto it and then you can do whatever you want. So let's look at how to do that next. So now I want to show you how to install custom firmware onto this device. The firmware I'm going to be using is ESP Home. You could also use Tasmoda. I'm a big fan of ESP Home and that's what I'm more familiar with, so that's what I'm going to demonstrate here. In order to put custom firmware onto the NS panel, you need a few things. You're going to need a couple screwdrivers to open it up. You're also going to need a USB to uh, serial adapter. This is a very ubiquitous type that you can find on Amazon for cheap. And this is the one that I'll be using. They're often called FTDI adapters, FTDI cables. You'll also need some way to connect from this to the headers on this board. I made a custom wiring harness here. Let me talk about this in a little bit when I connect this up just to make things a little bit easier for myself. I just used some pin headers, standard pin headers. Uh, I did one thing though, obviously snapped that off to five, but if you look closely, this is standard male pin header and this is the one that I used. And you can see that this, this is shorter on this end. You may not know on these things, they slide. So if you're careful, you can push this plastic bit uh, along in either direction. And so what I did was I pushed it down a little bit further toward one end in order to shorten the length of these pins. And we'll talk about why that is in a minute. And so then I just put it onto here. I'm just making sure I put it back the right way. Then I put this alligator clip with a female DuPont connector on there. I think I got these from Adafruit. I'm sure you can find them in a lot of places, but that makes it kind of easy also to put this together. Sorry about all the focus hunting as I move around. So this is kind of the cable that I end up with. And we'll go again into exactly how to use this when I take this thing apart. This is one of these, which I think is an I squared C cable of some sort that's used in PCs. I'm not really sure what this is for, but it has four wires and convenient identical connector on both ends that slips onto these pin headers really easily. But what I did with this one is I pulled out the wires from one end. So if you look at this closely, you can see that in the original, keep going back and forth here, in the original, the ends are identical. Red, white, black, gray on both sides. This one, if I put it the same way around, it's not identical at all. So on the one end I have red, white, black, gray. On the other one I have white, black, gray, red. And it's not just flipped. The reason for that is because this serial adapter here goes power, ground, transmit, receive. And so I put this end here on like that. And I remember that the red is power and that's how I know which direction it goes. And now I have this adjusted so that the other end will plug into this board and the pins will be in the correct order. So that's why I did that with this cable. Let's take this thing apart. Give it a little bit of a pry and this whole back piece will come right off. And then you just need to remove four screws. With those four small Phillips screws removed, this plastic piece just comes right off the back. 
and that exposes the circuit board. Conveniently, they have left this header right here for us to connect to. I keep calling it a header, but it's an unpopulated header. You could, of course, solder pins onto there and make it really easy to connect to. But I always like to avoid physically changing the board if I can mod something without touching it. It's always kind of fun. And you only need to do this once, so there's really no need to start soldering wires to everything if you can get away with it. This is labeled 3.3 volts, transmit, receive, ground, and IO0. And that is where my special custom connector comes in. So if I put that right in there, then I have the wires lined up in the correct order. And now the reason that I shortened these pins is because underneath this board, just underneath this board, there is a piece of metal. And so if the pins are too long, when you put something through here, you're very likely to short them against the uh, metal on the other side of this. So I made sure that these pins are just short enough that I can stick that in there. They'll stay with a little bit of pressure on it, but they won't go through all the way and short onto the metal on the other side. That's how I like to do it. You can do whatever you want. So what is this thing for? Well, on these ESP32 based boards, the way that you put them into firmware programming mode is by grounding the IO0 pin when you apply power to it. So I've got this other wire here, which is a male to female DuPont ends on it, and I can just slip this onto the ground pin. And so all I have to do is attach this. And now I am in the flash mode. Before we plug this in though, we have to actually have the firmware to flash onto it. So let's go over to the computer for a minute and we can talk about the process of installing and configuring ESP Home. ESP Home runs inside of Home Assistant. It's very, very easy to install. You just go into the supervisor and go to the add-on store and add the ESP Home add-on. Search for it here. Just click the button. Now, of course, if you're not using Home Assistant OS or supervised Home Assistant, then you will have to do this manually, follow the instructions for whatever weird setup you have. But I'm a big fan of Home Assistant OS. It makes these things much easier. Uh, I'll turn on Show in Sidebar. So we've got easy access to it over there and might as well turn on the watchdog as well. And we'll start ESP Home and now it is running. So we can access ESP Home from the left bar, and it displays in this frame here. This video is not a complete ESP Home tutorial. I don't have the time or the knowledge to do that. I'm just going to show you quickly the steps that I'm going through here to set this up. You can go read the manual, follow along, ask questions, whatever. Hopefully this will give you some pointers if you're not familiar with this thing and how to use it. We're going to tell that we have a new device. I'm going to give it a name here. We'll just call this uh, NS Panel Demo. The first time you do this, it's going to want to know your network name and password. It will store that information in a secrets file so that you don't have to enter it again. You also need to tell it which kind of uh, device you have. In this case, we'll just choose the generic ESP32. And now it's created the configuration. It's giving us a button here to install it, but I'm going to skip that because we actually want to, um, apparently I can't skip that. Let's just install and then cancel. I'm going to skip that because we actually want to edit the configuration. So this is our NS Panel demo device. There's an edit button here, pops you right into a text editor. And because we just selected ESP32 instead of any specific device, this is really a completely bare bones generic file here. So before we upload this, we actually want to put in the configuration that we need for this panel to work. And we'll do like a cooking show. I have one that I prepared earlier, so I'm just going to paste it in. I'll include a link to this file as well as all the other things I'm using here in the video description below. I don't have time to go through all 157 lines here in detail. This part is important. Nexteon is the screen that Sonoff is using and the current version of ESP Home, at least as of this recording, does not support the mode that this thing is in when you get it out of the box. So you're not able to take control of it unless you add these lines here, which download a fix from a GitHub pull request. Like it says in the comment here, if that fix has been merged into ESP Home by the time you do this, you won't need to include this part. That's what ESP Home looks like. 
in terms of setting up configuration files. And we'll be back here in a little while. But first, we're going to actually install this onto the device. So in order to install this thing, I'm going to first save this. Notice that we get, um, sometimes when I click that save button, you get an error. I don't know exactly why this happens, but it is a little bit precarious editing the files directly in the ESP Home Editor here, because sometimes what happens is you make a whole bunch of changes and then you click install and it fails to save. So I always click that save button and make sure that I get the green checkbox and not the red uh, X before I then go on to the install option again. I don't, I haven't looked on the forums or anything to see if that's a known issue, but it's just something to be careful about. If you edit the file external to ESP Home, then you're not gonna have that problem. There are a few different ways you can install the firmware. I'm going to ignore the first three of them and just show you how to do the manual installation. If you do happen to be able to plug your device into the computer that is running Home Assistant, um, this third option here will probably save you a little bit of time and trouble, but you can always rely on the manual download and flash it that way. So let's do that. I'm gonna click that button. And this is the part where ESP Home will gather the code that it needs to implement the features that you ask for, and it will compile everything and produce a firmware binary that you can then install. This takes a little while, especially the first time. We'll just skip to the end. So I'm going to download the file through my web browser and then we can proceed to installing it. So here we are once again with the NS panel with the back cover off, my FT232, my special wiring harness adapter. So let's go ahead and hook this thing up. I know because I made it that the red wire goes to 3V3 on there. So it's gonna go just like that and I'll put this here. It's all very precarious, but it works. And then I'm going to stick this onto the upper left pin in this case, which is ground. There we go. I'll connect the alligator clip to the ground. All I need to do is plug my FT232 into a USB port and hope no smoke comes out. Looks good. So now we've got the hardware connected up. We've got our firmware binary file and we just need to flash it. There are a few different ways to do this. You can read the ESP Home documentation to see what they all are. My choice here is to use a program called ESP Flasher. It makes this fairly easy. I just need to refresh the serial ports because I just plugged that thing in and now I've, it's found my FT232. I browse to my firmware file and just click flash ESP and it should go. And if everything was connected correctly, it will find the chip and it will start the flashing process. Like it says, this may take a while. We'll speed this up just a little bit. And there we go. At that point, it's done. We can disconnect this and put it back together. As usual with these things, reassembly is simply the reverse of disassembly. Make sure you put that plastic cover back on there. Put the four screws back in. And then the back simply snaps into the front. Now we can give it power and see if it boots up. The other thing we can do is watch the ESP Home panel in Home Assistant because when this boots up, it should connect to ESP Home and it'll say that it's online. So we'll give it some juice. Looks like it's starting to boot. That's always a good sign. The screen's not blank. And it has come online in ESP Home. So if you click the Logs button here, then you can actually view the logs in real time as they're streamed over from the device. So you can see it's spitting out some messages about updating the temperature. If I press these buttons here, to click the relays, you can see that the messages are being logged. And so now this is running ESP Home firmware instead of the Sonoff firmware. Still haven't changed what's on the screen yet. We'll get to that in the next step. But the nice thing is we now have total control over this device. So before we get to customizing the display, let's finish the setup in Home Assistant. When we booted this up and it connected to ESP Home, we got a new notification in Home Assistant. 
If I open this up, you'll see it's discovered new devices on the network. And that device is the NS panel demo that we just set up. So I can go here into the integration and just click configure and finish. And now we've added this device, which we can see in here, we have one new device. And if we look at the device, it has a bunch of entities, controls, sensors, configuration, diagnostics. This is all the stuff we added earlier in that YAML file in ESP Home. So we can turn on and off the relays here. We can also, of course, turn them on and off with the buttons. And when we do that, the state updates to match. And I can use this slider here to change the brightness. And of course we have the Wi-Fi signal strength at the bottom, which is useful if you want to troubleshoot why it's not staying connected. So there we go, that's how to get a device flashed with ESP Home firmware and connected to Home Assistant. Now this is not yet all that useful because the ultimate goal here was to be able to get rid of these built-in user interface elements and replace them with our own. That's going to take just a little bit more doing, but we're 90% of the way there now. So the next step is to use the Nexteon Editor software to custom design our own user interface and then load it onto this screen. And here is the Nexteon Editor. Yes, it is a terrible Windows application, but we will put up with it for the greater good. The first thing you need to do when you create a new HMI file, as they call it, is to select the model of display. This one is under Discovery. It's an NX4832F0350011. So choose that, and then you can choose the display orientation. In this case, I would much prefer a vertical orientation, and as it turns out here, zero degrees is upside down, so you have to choose 180. Character encoding I'll just leave and don't put anything in there, and I'll click OK. Now, I am absolutely not going to spend time trying to teach people how to use the Nexteon editor. You can figure that out on your own. Go read things on the internet. The program is free to download. It's awful. I don't know how to use it anyway, so I can't really tell you. But the idea is fairly straightforward. You create pages. So it's sort of a fixed layout type of situation where you define a number of pages and on each page you put different elements onto it. So for example, you could put some text here and that would give you a box that text goes into. This is something which is confusing. You have to actually generate a font. So you go to Tools Font Generator. It doesn't come with any built-in text, so you need to go in here and actually uh, ex basically export characters from the font to uh, what you want. I happen to like using Roboto Condensed, and we'll use 32 point, why not? So I'm just going to save this. And then you go in here to the fonts panel and you, you load it. So now I have my font installed and that should allow me to actually see the text. So the idea here again is not, you know, you can either put static text on the screen to label something or this could just be text that's updated by some event Maybe you want to display the current temperature, so you would put a box that displays the current temperature. What you do need to keep track of when you do stuff like this is keep track of the object names, right? So I need to know, if I want to update this text box, that it's on page zero and it's T0. I'm already explaining more about this than I really want to. So I'm just going to um, make the world's worst user interface, and I'm just going to put it on the top of the screen. They also have a maximum length for these. Uh, text things which you have to set frustratingly enough welcome to ESP home there and then I'll just put a couple of buttons on here so we'll do one copy paste paste you can do some basic layout stuff like aligning the top of all of them If I spread them out like that, align the top, and then you can equal space between them. There we go. Mm -hmm. 
So that was fun. <laughs> the thing actually crashed while I was in the middle of doing that and I lost all my quote unquote work. So save early, save often. There is no auto save in this thing. So um, yeah, lesson learned. I'm just gonna quickly try to recreate what I did. And then I wanna put more text. This one will have the current temperature in it. Okay, so placeholder text there for the weather. And change the object name here so I can find it more easily. We'll call this uh, temp. There's a lot of little details here that become important if you're really designing a UI and you can read about them. Um, I'm trying to do this just as quickly as possible. But what I do want to do is just change the labels on these. So we'll call this one play and we'll call this one on and we'll call this one off. I'm going to add just one more button while I'm here. Um, just because. Make this one kind of red. And we'll set the text to be red. Go red. How about that? Okay. So uh, for each of these, so one of the things I have learned is there are a lot of different ways to hook these buttons up, but the way I'm going to choose to do it is I'm going to select each button. I'm going to turn on down here under event, touch press event, send component ID. And then I'm also going to go to touch release event, send component ID. Do you have to do this tediously for every one of these buttons? I probably could have done it before I copied and pasted them and it would have make it would have made it easier. Uh, I don't know how to use this software, like I said, but just muddling through it so I can show you the basic idea. Okay, so we now have these all set to send component IDs and we have to make note of the fact, well, we don't have to make note of the fact, we can just look at it. So they have ID two, three, four, and six. And that's it. So that's all of the design I'm going to do here. You obviously, if you're designing your own control panel, you get as creative as you want. So we'll save that. Now the important part here is you can't use the HMI file. You have to go to file, TFT file output, and that will convert this HMI file to a TFT file, which is what you actually load onto the display. So I'm going to save that in a place where I can easily get to it. And now we're going to move on to the next step, which is to get this TFT file onto the display. In the interest of time, I'm going to speed through this part a little bit, but I want to point out it is documented here in the ESP Home documentation, so you can read this about uploading a TFT file and how to host it in Home Assistant under the Nexion TFT LCD display section. So it's all documented here. I'm just gonna basically do what it says. I'm going to go into Supervisor and I'm going to install the file editor add-on, which will allow me to create the directory and upload the file that it tells me to in the ESP Home documentation. So we'll just put this in the sidebar as well to make it easier. Go over into the file editor. I will open up my config directory and I will add a new folder named www. Click OK, we'll go into it and then I'm going to upload a file. I will grab the nspaneldemo.tft file that we just exported from Nexteon editor and I will stick it here into config www and that file is now going to be available to upload to the panel. Now I need to go back into ESP Home and I need to configure uploading. And so I'm gonna go back into my YAML config here and go down under display and I'm going to add TFT URL and we'll save that. See, it didn't work the first time or the second time or the third time, but it worked the fourth time. Now we need to do one more thing, which is we need to have the ability to trigger this upload. So we're going to go to where we've defined the API services here and I'm going to add a new service. 
And I'm going to get that straight out of the documentation here. So you can see how they, there's a Lambda call here to upload the file. So I'm going to add service, upload TFT, I'll call it. Then Lambda ID, in this case, my display is called disp1, get that from down there, arrow, upload underscore TFT, save, save, there we go. Okay, so now we have defined, wherever that was, we defined the uh, URL down here to get the file from, and then we have implemented a service here that we can call to trigger the actual upload. And so now we want to install the new firmware that has those features added to it. This time, because the device is already online, we've already installed ESP Home once. You only ever need to do that once the hard way. After that, you can click on wireless and it'll actually upload over the air. And now it's pushing that file over to the display, at which point it should reboot with the updated firmware. And there it is it's back up and running. So what we can do now is go into the Home Assistant Developer Tools and we can go into Services and we should have, if we look down in here, our new Upload TFT service. So we just select that service and then click Call Service and I can go back to the logs here and just make sure that it's working. Okay, so that did not work. It turns out you have to restart Home Assistant after you create that www directory for the first time. So we're just gonna do that and see if we can get it working. I didn't wanna edit out that mistake in case people are following along because that would be really confusing. Why did it work for him and not for me? Hopefully this restart is all that it takes. Okay, I'm gonna return to ESP Home, make sure I'm looking at the logs here, and then I will go over call this service, and we should be able to watch it load. No. No go. Okay, that still wasn't working after rebooting, but I'm fairly confident I know what the problem is because I've seen this before and I just remembered. It doesn't seem to like MDNS URLs, so I had to replace the home assistant blah blah dot local with the IP address. So let's click this button and see what happens. Okay, it looks like it did actually download the file this time. And yep, it's now doing the update on the screen. So once that finishes, we should have our new user interface. Takes a little while to rewrite the flash on there. Okay, there it is, see, it started up and it has the interface that we made in that crunchy Windows software. We got our message on the top, we got our three buttons, our four buttons, and when I press these buttons, it logs to the log that it's got a touch from page zero, component two, three, four, and six, and so now, of course, they don't do anything yet because we haven't hooked anything up, but getting to this point was really most of the battle. So now what we want to do to add some functionality is start exposing these things to Home Assistant. So we added four buttons and a temperature display. So let's do the buttons first. Uh, we can treat these buttons as binary sensors. So they will report their status to Home Assistant just like the two physical buttons do. So if we define those, platform next to on. Then we give it a name, so we'll just follow the same convention we've been using. We'll make this the uh, play button. And we'll tell it what page it's on. Page zero, component ID. We know from watching the logs that we have button two, three, four, and six. So we can just copy and paste this. So the on button is number three, the off button, oops, the off button is number four, 
and the red button is number six. And again, save that and install it. Once this is finished uploading, it will reboot, and then we should have new sensors available in Home Assistant. And if I go over to the device in Home Assistant, you can see now, in addition to the left and right button we had before, we also have all these additional buttons. And when I press on them on the screen, hopefully, they're doing the thing we want them to do. There we go. So all these buttons are now active. So what can we do with these? Well, it's easy enough to create an automation. So I could just click on new automation here and I could say do something when, and let's use the play button. So we can find the uh, play button turned on, which happens when you touch that button and it'll set this up for us. So we'll just say um, play a song when button pressed. And we can leave a lot of these that are filled in automatically for us. So demo NS panel play button turned on, no conditions. And then what action do we want here? Well, we can use our service call that we set up earlier, which is ESP home play RTTTL. Now these are uh, old Nokia ringtone strings. So I can paste one in here and save this. Automation is saved here, and so, in theory now, if I press this button, it should play some music. And so not only can we completely custom design whatever sort of interface we want on here, but we're no longer restricted to just the devices that Sonoff supports in their eWeLink app. For example, I have a light bulb here that is controlled by a competitor's project, but it's all compatible with Home Assistant. So I can just go in and create an automation. For example, when the on button is pressed, I can, I'm just gonna make this really, really quickly, go down here, and for my device, I'm going to select this smart dimmer switch, and I'm gonna set it to turn on, and save, and then I'll do one more. When the off button is pressed, so I want, off button turned on. I know it's a little confusing. And we'll just say off here. And go down to the device and we'll set it to smart dimmer switch. And we'll turn it off and click save. So now we should have two additional automations. If I press on, it turns the bulb on. If I press off, it turns the bulb off. And of course the sky is the limit with what you can do with any of these things. I put this extra button in because I was going to set it to turn the lights in the room red, but I think I'm selling past the close here. We might as well finish this out though by making that temperature update. I want to wrap this up so rather than you watching me type it in, I'm just going to cut to the chase here. I zoom down a little bit. You can see now that this has uh, got a temperature that's updated there. And the way we did that is fairly straightforward. It's the same thing in two places, but number one is I added this part here, which creates a sensor that captures an attribute from Home Assistant. So there's a weather entity in Home Assistant and it has a temperature attribute, which is the current temperature outside according to the weather platform you're using. And so this pulls that into ESP Home. And then I have a trigger here. Every time that value is updated, it'll execute this Lambda, which is a little bit ugly looking, but basically says, remember we named that temp earlier in the editor? So it basically says to change the value of the component that's called temp, and then it just uses a little bit of string formatting here to display it with one decimal place and a degree symbol. Um, and then because I want it to update not just when the value changes, but also right after it boots, I've put the same thing in here, except in this case we have to pull the state out of the current temperature rather than it being passed to us because this is not a trigger on the value changing, this is a on setup trigger. So anyway, those little bits of code there, cause this to display that number, and then when the, weather, when the weather changes, it will update that number. To finish this off, of course, there are a lot of little fine details that you have to get right, especially when you change pages, you need to refresh all the components, etc., etc. But that's the basic idea of how you can take one of these Nexteon NS panels, 
flash the ESP Home custom firmware onto it, use the Nexteon editor to design your own custom user interface, and then wire everything up two-way so when you do stuff in here it affects things through Home Assistant and when things change in Home Assistant it can affect what's on the display. I'm going to say the thing that everybody says. If you enjoyed this video I would really appreciate if you subscribe to my channel, maybe give me a like, maybe engage in the comments. It's a lot of work to put these things together. I've actually spent three days just recording this video so far and I don't know how long it's going to take me to edit it and get it posted. It's a lot of work so it's really encouraging when I see that people are actually enjoying and watching the content and that makes me want to make more. If I post the thing and it's just a dud then I'm probably going to give up. Like I said I will put a bunch of links in the description below the video if you want to find this YAML file that I used or you need to locate any of these products or download links or anything like that. And if you have any questions, if there's something I didn't explain very well, just let me know in the comments and I'll see if I can clarify. But otherwise, that's it for me. Have fun and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.